Well, hello, brethren. I'm happy to be here today as uh, David is away for a while for this weekend. Um, happy Sabbath to you all. Peaceful Sabbath. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit, not necessarily about prophecy, so to speak, but a, uh, a segment of that, maybe I'll say. All right. Um, because fulfilled prophecy can be a great way to validate whether something, someone is a so-called prophet and indeed a true prophet or if they're a self-prophesized prophet coming up with uh, goofy things because we know we've had plenty of that out there, correct? Um, but even more than that, what I want to bring the focus in today is um, fulfilled prophecy is proof of God. The God of the Bible is God. Remember that. He is the God. This people's God that we read about in the big portion of our Bible, their God is God. Remember that. And that his words are trustworthy. So, we know we have truth in there. But I'm going to look at several instances of the Bible, which again, I don't think can be understated uh, to support the trustworthiness of it, um, as well as the mind and the character of uh, the God of creation. Um, and by the way, Bible prophecies aren't riddled with hocus pocus and vagueness like... Uh, uh, Nostradamus and, and some other uh, folks that have come and lot, led people far astray, haven't they? But uh, I, like many of you, also feel God's Holy Spirit to the depth of my very being. And so which many of you as me, that's enough. I know that. I feel that. Yet, to have all of these other circumstances, creation and prophecy, and something I'm going to talk about today, numbers. Not uh, the book of numbers, but uh, how numbers, and God uses that, all right? We can test the claims in the statement of the Bible. We can find instance after instance to trust God's teachings and God's prophets within it, and we see the character, the heart of our Creator, because we see structured, planned, and organized logic. Something that just falls off the table and happens to land upright uh, is chance. When we have things that are structured, which numbers show us, we see plans and we see organization and we see the logic there, all right? So enough of that. Uh, moving on there. I'm gonna look at some numbers like three, seven, eight, the number 40 and others um, that shine light on that definitive purpose rather than randomness. So uh, you just don't find randomness in God's character, do we? He's trustworthy. What he says comes true. Um, so another, but another a tool or a method is that God uses is parallels. I'm going to put it in the form of a coin. All right. Uh, I've got two sides to that coin and I'm going to bring out two different sides of that that are parallels, parallels that I think also, uh, play an important part and I like to recognize because I see uh, that structure and things in God's plans in, in this parallel. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask us all to, in our mind's eye, I'm going to mention a couple of animals and I want you in your mind's eye to kind of picture what these animals mean to you. All right. Uh, the first one of the two is the dove. The dove. Think about a dove. What does that bring in mind? 
We'll call that maybe one side of the coin a dove. We'll flip the coin to the other side. The other animal I want us to think about is a lamb. A lamb. Sorry, I hear some sounds outside. If you hear that, some rumbling around, you know. This world doesn't take any time off, do they? They're building houses behind us and mowing grasses. So if you hear some noises, uh, uh, please pardon those. Anyway, the dove and the lamb. Um, usually a dove, I think we'll all agree, is used as a symbol of peace. We see them releasing doves. It's a symbol of peace. Let's look at the dove in Scripture. All right? The dove first appears as announcing, so to speak, the rebirth of mankind and the earth and its creatures. All right, that's what we see as the dove returns to Noah in the ark. And this is why I say that. If we recall a couple of, a, a, that there were a couple of attempts, right? Um, in There was a raven and a female uh, dove. But in Genesis 8.10, this is what it says, Genesis 8.10, he waited another seven days. What's that number seven represent? Perfection, right? Completeness. And again, sent the dove out from the ark. The dove came into him in the evening, and there in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth, cleared from the earth. So I asked, was that just a random chance that the dove returned, of all things, with an olive leaf? Is that the only kinds of trees on the earth? Olive trees? Of course not. There's taller trees. Um, an oak tree or a uh, you know, tons of evergreens. Maybe they're hard to pluck the leaves off of those, but lots of other. So here we have an olive leaf. In my opinion, I don't think it's just random. Consider uh, this. I'm going to read you something here from the uh, Israel Olive Bond website. They write in their introduction, the olive tree, which has been an important component of Jewish and Israel culture throughout history, has become a symbol of many values in Jewish life. The olive is one of seven species with which the land was blessed. It is mentioned frequently in the Bible in the contents of blessings, fruitfulness, and health. Ooh, we know the olives are very healthy, aren't they? Uh, eventually, continuing, eventually it became linked to the concept of putting down roots in the land, and therefore the olive branch appears in the emblems of the state of Israel and of the Israel Defense Forces, and is also a symbol of peace, referring to the story of Noah's Ark and the dove. So they liken back to that too. So again, the dove symbolizes blessings, fruitfulness, health, peace, and the greatest of all of these, to me anyway, is that it's used to picture God's Spirit, the Spirit of God descending. Let's look at Matthew 3.16. Matthew 3.16 is recorded as... I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible. I like its little simpleness here that it puts. As soon as Yeshua, or Jesus as we know him, has been immersed, he came up from the water. At that moment, the heavens were opened. He saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, by the way, uh, another translation I have says a uh, bat voice, a B-A-T voice, uh, Hebrew for daughter's voice. So, so think of it as a soft 
gentle, caring voice that comes from heaven and says, This is my son, whom I love. I am well pleased with him. Isn't that a wonderful um, message right there, just in Matthew 3.16? So I think we can summarize, though, a dove, you know, from that as the spirit of God's blessings. So what's the parallel then to the lamb? We have a dove. We just mentioned that. I also mentioned the lamb. The other flip side of the coin. The lamb symbolizes gentleness, right? Gems aren't, lambs aren't violent. <laughs> They're very gentle, innocent, and purity. Hmm. In actual life, actuality, those are also perceived characters of a dove. Also. The lamb, though, very specifically as the animal that God chooses for sacrifice. Exodus 12.1 says this from the American Standard Version, which uses, you'll hear me say, Yehovah, um, listen, <laughs> whatever God calls you to, okay? But we know the American standard, even the King James, it has, uh, they'll have it as Yehovah with an I from the 1611 King James when the J became uh, introduced into the King's language in the 1500s, they introduced a J. So you've got Jehovah in your King James Bible and in the American Standard Bible, which I uh, like to use. So reading from that, Exodus 12, 1. And Yehovah spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month. Hmm. Three and seven equals ten. Okay. They shall take to them every man a lamb, according to their father's houses. And verse 6 then says this, Ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Two times seven, fourteen, okay. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at even, uh, between the two evenings. So God chose the symbol of gentleness, innocence, that would come to also represent purity as the first sacrificial animal for Israel. And as we know, that same symbol, Yeshua, Jesus, as the Lamb of God for the sacrifice for all of mankind. So looking at the parallel, the dove to symbolize the spirit of God's blessing, the lamb to symbolize innocence, purity, and sacrifice. Now for Israel, that sacrifice was simply a covering. For us, though, we know um, God's sacrifice of his son as the lamb goes beyond that to remove as far as east from west, no longer of remembrance, salvation, so that we can have eternal life. So just in case that parallel isn't uh, set out enough here, I'm going to drive it through a little bit more. The dove, a symbol of the blessing of God's uh, spirit descending. The, how about this? The word became flesh is surely God's greatest blessing, right? And promise of rebirth, salvation through his lamb. But I'm going to keep looking at this. I have more. How do you say dove in Hebrew? How do we say dove in Hebrew? Well, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to read Matthew 3.16 again, except this time I'm going to use that Hebrew word. All right? The same but different. Listen, Matthew 
but I'm going to use the Hebrew word for dove. As soon as Yeshua, Jesus, had been immersed, he came out of the water. At that moment, heaven opened. He saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a Jonah. Jonah is the, in Hebrew, is dove. You can look at that if you want to look at uh, Strong's uh, number 3123. You'll see there, Jonah, dove. Um, they are the same word there. So they're different, but they're the same. And they say that the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a Jonah, like a dove. So that brings our little parallel I've been talking about here. We've got uh, Jonah on one side of the coin, Yeshua on the other side of the coin. How do we say Yehovah's salvation in Hebrew? It would be Yehoshua or Joshua in your English Bibles. So Joshua's name was Yehoshua. Now the shortened version of Yehovah's salvation, of course, that's where we get Yeshua. Um, both Jonah and Shua were prophets, right? They told of things uh, from God to come in the future. God chose Jonah, Yonah, to carry the prophetic message to the people of Nineveh. That's the most famous thing that we know of with Jonah, probably. I'll refer to it real briefly here. Jonah 1.1 1, 1 says... Now the word of Yehovah came upon Jonah, the son of Amiti, Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. It wasn't just a small city. Over 120,000 people, all right? A big city. And cry against it. Proclaim against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. So God sent a dove to proclaim prophecy, the message of their wickedness, and to repent. We're going to look at this a little bit deeper here. I want to notice, though, um, the first thing about Luke's notes that Yeshua did after being baptized and coming back up from the wilderness, where he had been fasting tested by the adversary for 40 days another important number 40 days there's one um, that's that's that one of those numbers we're going to talk about more but directly after that Yeshua goes into the temple where he stands and reads from the temple scroll stands and reads from the prophet speaking of Hebrew Yasha Yasha Yahu Yasha Yahu is Isaiah and interestingly enough I don't know if many some of you are going to know this but Yasha Yahu Isaiah the meaning of that name is also salvation of Yehovah all right, let's get to that reading. though. Luke reads in Luke 4.18. I'll go ahead and read that. In the Spirit, the Spirit of Yehovah is upon me. Remember that dove, that Jonah? Used to symbolize God's Spirit. Therefore, he has anointed me to announce, prophesy, good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, prophesy, freedom for the imprisoned and renewed sight for the blind to release those who have been crushed down. In parenthesis, it says, open the prison gates to those who are bound and to proclaim prophesy 
the year of favor of Yehovah. I've got my um, Institute of Scripture Research Bible here. I love this one too. What they did is they went back to the original Aleppo Codex and the uh, Leningrad Codexes instead of just translating from another translation. They started over. Just since we're on this, I like reading this one too. Um, again, Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Master Yehovah is upon me because Yehovah has anointed me to bring good news to the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Bind up, meaning to heal, to wrap their wounds of their heart. To proclaim release to the captives and opening the prisons of those who are bound. That's a physical description, but it's meaning spiritual things, of course, to release. What are we bound by here? What are we surrounded by on this earth? So there's a clear parallel there. Both claim to proclaim, to prophesy as a spokesperson, God's message. Both offered their lives to save others. But as you know, Jonah didn't want to obey God, right? No. Jonah gives us an explanation that's pretty simple. The book of Jonah is four, just four short chapters. It's a, on my Bible, it's uh, two pages. Um, Jonah gives us an explanation for his extreme displeasure with God and his request. I'll read it here in Jonah 4, 1 through 3. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed unto Jehovah the Eternal, and said, I pray thee, O Jehovah, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I hasted to flee unto Tarfish, Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. And I repentest thee of the evil there, and repentest thee of the evil. That God repentest thee of that evil. Therefore now, O Yehovah, O Eternal, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow! God's merciful and abundant loving kindness makes Jonah feel this way? There's something more to this picture. Jonah's not giving us the whole picture here, I don't think. That he would be so upset by that? There's something else there between Jonah and Nineveh. Or could it be the king of Nineveh that he's got something against? I'm going to pause to consider what is written in the Jewish Midrash, the Talmud also. I do not put these writings at the same biblical level, of course, as as as, Bib as Bible writings, all right? But I think um, that God j did choose Jewish scribes to write and record a lot of these things, to hold on to the scriptures for us as well, collect those, right? And we can look at these writings that are expansive, uh, they were Jewish rabbinic uh, mode of biblical interpretation, right? They would interpret different parts of the Bible. There's parts in there that I completely reject with the oral Torah and things. But they also have a value of historical insight. Historical insight that began, they began, we have, uh, as far as dates go, recorded around the second century, although much uh, of their content is really considered much earlier. 
Okay, so perhaps at, at Jesus' time. So I want to read. It's a beautiful writing. So I'm going to read um, and consider something from the Midrash, uh, written by Rabbi Jeffrey uh, Wheel. Well, okay, listen. An Egyptian stands at the edge of the sea, watching his countrymen drown in its waters. He grieves for the dead, the firstborn, including his own family. He hears the Israelites singing, Mi Hamacha Be'ilam, in English, Yehovah, who is like you among other gods? eternal God. And this Egyptian, nurtured in the culture of idolatry, responds to the Israelites as he stands and watches them on the other side of the shore with a whisper under his breath, Mi kamacha nidar ba kadosh, in English, who is like you? Awesome. In, the, in this Midrash Torah portion, the man standing there now fully and deeply understands that the God of Israel is God like no other. He shakes his head in awe and walks, but not back to Israel. Not to Israel, but into the desert. He walks far east and finally arrives in Nineveh, massive and full of wickedness. He tells the Ninevites about the God of Israel, who punished his wicked land. He warns them that their wickedness can lead to ruin. But they don't listen. They are impressed by this regal man, and so they make him king. One day, a Hebrew prophet enters Nineveh and calls, Forty more days and Nineveh is destroyed. That's it. This prophet is Jonah. The king would never forget that that other Israelite messenger, Moses, who predicted Egypt's ruin. So he understands Jonah's threat as genuine. He commands the Ninevites to repent, and they do so and are saved. The king marvels that the same God who displayed ferocity against Egypt displays boundless compassion toward Nineveh. Who was this Egyptian who stood by the sea and whispered, Mi Hamacha, acknowledging God? Who was this man who came to understand God's compassion and truth of repentance? According to this Midrash, this Egyptian was none other than Pharaoh himself. Yes, Pharaoh, whose heart was hard as adamant rock, whose slavish fidelity to idolatry destroyed his people, who committed genocide against slaves, who scorned Moses with, who is your God that I should listen to him? That same man became the repenting king of Nineveh in the book of Jonah. Our tradition, again, this is the rabbi reading from typically understands Pharaoh as beyond repentance, but this Midrash takes a different view. The gates of repentance are always open and to all. As we read the Shabbat about that moment at the sea, may we recall that even the most intransigent hearts Pharaohs and ours can recognize 
this powerful truth. Okay, so again, I don't hang my hat on that as biblical, but, and some will argue against it. And I, I think some of those that argue against it are probably also that want to argue against that even Israel even existed and want to record the whole incident away as not ever happening. But anyway, that's what we have there recorded as history in the in the Midrash. And I think it's something that, for me anyway, it's like, okay. So Jonah used just eight Hebrew words. We don't have recorded that he went on and gave them a big speech or anything. Eight simple words that changed and caused 120 sinning people in Nineveh to fast, repent, even their cattle, right? So back to this dove, this Jonah, who thought he could run away from his appointed task. What a huge difference, though, as we flip that coin over to Yeshua, who came willingly. We know that Jonah, Jonah could not run away from God, right? He boarded a ship uh, to attempt to flee, and he was on that ship sleeping below. I'll try to just condense some of that. We know this story. He's sleeping down there, and... They see this great storm come up and they perceive, because uh, they got, these were not people that worshipped the God of Israel. They had their gods that they worshipped and they're crying out to their gods, nothing's happening. They perceive, wait, who's this stranger down there uh, in the bowels of our ship? Let's go wake him up and talk to him. They find out, uh, and Jonah actually confesses to them. He says in verse 12, take me up and cast me into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon him. Yet even then, the people, they go back up still and they still continue to pray to their gods, their idols and things, and nothing calms. So eventually they go down and they pray God's forgiveness for them, that he doesn't hold that against that they toss Jonah into the sea. There's some other big turning, right? from their idolic gods to the God of Israel. I think it's uh, verse 14. They cried unto Yehovah and said, We beseech thee, O Yehovah, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's sake, and lay not his head upon us innocent blood. Anyway. So, of course, we know this. And what happens? Uh, God then sends a great whale, beast, sea, beast, fish, whatever you want to call it, and they brought Jonah inside itself, right? There's a number involved, right? The number three? There's a special number of three nights, three days. Now, was that just random? Could it have been two, four, five, one? It was three. The account specified three days and three nights for a very special prophetic reason. We're coming up to a season of that time right now, as a matter of fact. And that leads us back to Yeshua. Yeshua, aside from proclaiming and prophesying, he came to save as the Lamb of God. His very name says that exactly. Yehoshua, Joshua, Yehovah's salvation. So let's notice again, though, in Luke's writings, he tells us here how Yeshua entered Jericho and encountered Zacharias, a rich tax collector. And as we know, tax collectors were considered sinful, just like Matthew, all right? They were considered sinners. Zacharias was perceived as a sinner, and he had climbed up into this tree so that he could see Jesus coming. Luke 19.5 says, When he came to this place, he looked up and said to him, Zachariah, hurry, come down, because I have come to stay at your house today. Wow. 
crowd was amazed at that, right? He climbed down as fast as he could and welcomed Yeshua joyfully. Everyone who saw it began murmuring, muttering amongst each other. He is going into the house as a guest of a sinner? Wow, they were taken back by that. Verse 9 says, Yeshua said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, inasmuch as this man too is a son of Abraham. And the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. John 10, 18. Regarding that, I just want to make this really clear. Yeshua said, No one takes it away from me. On the contrary, I lay it down of my own free will. Refer into his life. So consider the other side of that coin. Jonah, the dove, he was angry with God because of God's grace. Which was one of the reasons he still held such resentment for that king. He didn't even want to go there. He didn't want to go anywhere near that king. He probably in his heart held a lot of resentment, maybe even hatred for that king, Pharaoh. If this is true, I'm not hanging my head hard on it, but it certainly explains quite a bit, doesn't it? Why that, those, just those short eight words that 120,000 plus, that was, that was the dove's mission. Yet, for us, it's not just 120,000. It's a world full, past, present, and future as the perfect, pure, sinless Lamb of God sacrificed for complete washing away of our sins. And I'm going to mention another number, that number 40. I mentioned it just now, but um, remember that before Yeshua went to the temple? Remember, uh, Yeshua went to the temple. He read from, stood and read from Isaiah after being tested in the wilderness for 40 days, a number that means, represents testing, being in the wilderness. After being expelled by the whale onto the shore and where Jonah finally decides he's going to obey grudgingly, right? And he's instructed to go and proclaim Jonah 3, 4 says, And Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey, and he cried, he proclaimed, and said, These are those few words, eight Hebrew words in English, saying, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was it. That's all he said. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast put on sackcloth from the greatest to them, even to the least of them. And as we know, they included their cattle as well in that fast. Forty days. Now, why did God use this number 40 in this warning? Did God not know the hearts of Nineveh? Did God get caught off guard when they repented? Did he really not expect them to repent? Really? I think not. So since he knows the hearts of people even before they act, then why this number 40? Because numbers mean something to God. He wants to point those out. And he shows them time and time again. And I think, to me anyway, this proves his trustworthiness. Um, could have been, of course, some other number. Um, but there is more future prophetic significance to that number, 40, and the number three. And we're going to take a look at that in part two. Let me give us a little break, chance to stand up and shake our legs, get some coffee, whatever. I'll be back very shortly for part two, as I've got some great stuff 
in part two also. So we'll see you in just a few moments.